Welcome to SMC TV. I'm Marshall Wilson. Autism, it's a puzzling disorder that affects one child in every 150 children. Today, we're going to find out about the latest research, learn about resources here in San Mateo County, and find out about one family's journey with autism. I'm joined here by Dr. Heidi Feldman of Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford and Lisa Valerio, the parent of a child with autism. Let's start out with you, Lisa. Tell us about your son. My son is five and a half years old. His name is Nathan Tyler Valerio, and he is this beautiful, beautiful little boy. Of course, I'm biased. Um, and he loves to tickle and play tag, and he loves to go horseback riding. He loves to swim. Um, he's just, he's a joy. He's the love of my life. That's great. And Dr. Feldman, I think we were, before the show we were talking, and autism is just one part of a child, and I think that's what uh, Lisa brings up here. Absolutely. So, you know, all of us have abilities where we exceed and abilities where we're not as strong. So some of us are really good academically, but we can't sing on tune or can't throw a football. Children with autism similarly have a range of abilities. The areas where they tend to have the most weakness is in language and communication and in social skills. And yet they may have a wide range of other abilities that are really fun uh, to interact with. And how is a child typically diagnosed? What is the process like? Um, children are diagnosed on the basis of their behavior. There's no test, there's no medical blood test or scan or anything like that mm -hmm. that tells us whether a child has autism or not. So usually what happens is that a parent is suspicious because of something in the child's development or behavior. They seek the consult of a pediatrician or another trusted professional, and that professional, along with the parent, observes the child in both unstructured and structured ways, and together come to the diagnosis. And Lisa, what was the process like for your family? Um, I'm going to start back a little bit and talk about sort of how I saw the signs mm -hmm. um, and which led us to that. Um, my son Nathan was, uh, as they call it, sort of neurotypically developing up until about the age of two years, two years and three months. Um, was talking, playing, interacting, um, very typically, no signs of, um, of any of the signs of autism, which I'm sure we can we'll get into. But one of the signs and what led me to concerns was he would say words and he'd have them and then all of a sudden he'd stop using them and then they would maybe come back. And so I brought that up with our pediatrician and she said, let's have his speech evaluated. And we went in and we had his speech evaluated. And at the time, my sister, who is a special ed teacher, had said, you know, why don't you ask them about autism? Because we noticed that he started to get really mesmer mesmerized and sort of um, fixated on the ceiling fans that were in her home. And I brought that up and, they, and the speech pathologist, obviously, who, you know, cannot diagnose autism, but said, you know, why don't you, um, I'm going to have you get a referral into Golden Gate Regional Center and they can take a look at your son and help determine if they see any signs of autism. Um, but we are showing some delays in speech, so they, are, they recommended the speech um, therapy. And then I went and had, um, we, three months later, because there's quite the wait list, um, we got into Golden Gate Regional Center and that's when they um, noticed the early signs of autism. If you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at a child's development, the cardinal signs of autism are in three areas. The first area is social interaction, how the child interacts with adults <clears throat> and other children. <clears throat> The second area is communication, and the third area is called either restricted behaviors or repetitive behaviors. Um, for most children, unlike Nathan, the um, development slowly goes awry in those three areas. Sometimes it's very subtle, and parents don't even know exactly when their concerns began, someplace at a year or a year and a half, moving toward two years of age. In some proportion of children, um, the signs come on suddenly or gradually, but after a normal period of development. And that's Nathan's situation. Nathan was a bit older than many of the children who present with that regressive pattern. But that is about, oh, uh, the, the presentation in about 30% of children. So when should parents, what are some of the signs that, you, you touched on that a bit, but when should a parent say, hmm, I really need to go see a specialist? Um, 
the parents really know their children the best and there's some point at which there's an aching feeling that something isn't going right. For some parents there's um, no clear idea until the child is in, in with other children of the same age and they can make a comparison. That's particularly true I think of parents of firstborn children. But at the same time, some of the professionals that uh, a child meets should be doing screening uh, in case the parents haven't noticed the cardinal signs. So um, one of the obligations of pediatricians is to ask about, observe, and test children for their developmental status. We hope that that's going to happen when the children are nine months of age, 18 months of age, and someplace between two and, and two and a half years of age. And that screening should be pretty systematic so that if families haven't noticed or if families express some concerns, that can be validated by a screening test. And why is early intervention so important? Ah, early intervention <laughs> is extremely important because um, the child's development is going awry with autism. And we want to get in and intervene while the child is young and the brain is still very plastic. So the earlier we get in, the more likely we are to redirect the way the brain is developing to be more like typical development. And the evidence shows that the earlier and more intensive the program, the greater the likelihood that that child will make good progress and may even end up at kindergarten indistinguishable from other children of the same age. And I bet you have something to say about this, the way you uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, smiled I, and nodded. I, well, I truly believe in early intervention. I mean, I think we um, made tremendous strides by having early intervention, and it also was um, the foundation that helped me and my husband um, really understand what we were up against and also it led us and it gave us the tools that we needed in to be able to really interact with our son. So I think that it's crucial that um, early intervention and in, in that we catch this as early as possible. Right. So the way that you obtain early intervention in San Mateo County is via the Golden Gate Regional Center. And um, parents can make a referral to Golden Gate Regional Center themselves, or their uh, physician can help them with that referral. Um, once they uh, approach Golden Gate Regional Center, there will be an evaluation to determine whether the child's eligible. And then if the child's eligible, they'll go into one of the community-based services here in San Mateo County. We're very fortunate. We have terrific resources in this county. So once the child is enrolled, there are many options. And each child should have an individualized program that considers their strengths as well as their needs, and also considers the family's strengths and the family's needs. So the family, as Lisa said, can be the best, not only advocate, but also uh, interventionist with their child. And what resources have you found to be the most helpful? I would say that, um, like I was talking about earlier, at I was fortunate to be able to go to Community Gate Path for Nathan's Early Intervention, and they have a Family Resource Center there. And they really helped me with all the, the, the tools and resources that I needed. But I would say the, the most important and the most um, the most valuable resource that I have come across or resources actually is other parents um, and parents who actually have children who um, are on the spectrum that are a little bit older than my son um, because then I could actually tap into them and really ask them what worked for them, what didn't, and then be able to tailor that and look at those resources and then determine what was going to be the most appropriate approach for me to take with my son. So I'd say parents interacting and talking with other parents with children on the spectrum. And I imagine that also lets you know you're not alone. There's a whole community out there. Yes, and there is a very large community um, that's very supportive. Family resource centers are a, a very um, essential point uh, uh, for families to learn the ways into the system. Our system, unfortunately, is not organized and coordinated through a single doorway, and it requires finding all these different resources, many of which have no formal relationships with other resources. And so um, the Family Resource Center can be a springboard into many other resources within the county and beyond the county. Um, it's it's um, 
the kind of thing that humanizes the information that you might find on the internet. There's great information on the internet and we wanted to highlight a couple of the websites that families might find useful. Uh, one of my favorites is called autismspeaks.org and it has a terrific um, website. The part that I think families might find particularly useful is called the 100 Day Kit. And it's for families just at the beginning of the process so that they can understand their child, their own emotions, and the kinds of resources that would be helpful in aiding their child. And another um, website that I think is really important to bring up here in San Mateo County is the AbilityPath.org website, which will be going up, I think, in, yes, in, a, couple of in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And this will be a terrific portal for families of children with autism and also other developmental conditions. And it will lead them to many of the other high quality websites all across the internet. And it will also personalize the experiences of families of children with disabilities here in San Mateo County, highlighting some of the special resources that you can find here, um, such as horseback riding or swimming. Right, and you can share information there about great places to go and things to do. Yes. I wanted to shift gears just a minute and talk about some of the potential causes of autism. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what, what is the latest we hear about that in your research? We think that autism is a genetic disorder. Um, and what's incredibly interesting these days is the way that we're learning that genes cause disorders, especially behavioral disorders. So when I was a medical student, we thought about genes mm, kind of like the way we think about them affecting hair color or eye color. You know, if daddy's blonde and mommy's brunette, then the child has some probability of being blonde and some probability of being brunette. It's way more complicated than that. And what we're learning is that there are many different genetic conditions that can lead to autism. And that those same genetic conditions can lead to other neurodevelopmental disorders. So it's called a many-to-many -many mapping. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a specific gene that is affected. And sometimes there's a bit of genetic material that's either deleted or duplicated where it shouldn't be. And that's been called a copy number variant. So the genetic testing that gets done when a child is diagnosed with autism looks for all of these different variations. I imagine that this genetic testing is going to evolve pretty dramatically in the next five to 10 years. Right now, we do a series of about three or four genetic tests where we think we have the greatest probability of identifying the genetic cause. One more thing that I'd like to say is many parents are afraid of immunizations as a cause of autism. And the reason they get afraid is very understandable. The child often presents with the core symptoms in the second year of life after the child's received some immunizations. There have been now many really well done studies that show no difference between children who got immunizations and children who didn't get immunizations and how prevalent autism is in the two populations. And we are seeing a recurrence of some of the very nasty disorders that those immunizations prevent. Measles, for one, is a very, very um, potentially serious infection. So we do not think that um, immunizations are the cause of autism. We do think that a genetic underpinning is the cause. And that's a very important point to leave us with for our first half here of SMC TV. We'll be right back to hear more about autism and resources here in San Mateo County. Thanks for joining us. Because I have a doctor's appointment. Because I'll see if something's coming. Because I've done it before. Because I can get out of the way in time. Because is no excuse. Be smart. Be safe. Wait for the gate. I'm Mark Simon. I'm Bob Marks. It's our favorite spectator sport. The day of reckoning is fast approaching. We're just going to shoot the bull. Join Mark Simon and Bob Marks each week on The Game as they cover the Bay Area's top stories, bringing you in-depth analysis on politics, 
business, and sports. Don't sit on the sidelines, get into the game. Sundays at 6.30 p.m. right here on Peninsula TV. Emmy Award-winning Peninsula TV provides a large multifunctional TV studio and video production facility, state-of-the-art equipment, and affordable prices. Let our professional staff and crew produce your company or organization's next video, or create your own TV series and air it on one of the Bay Area's largest community cable channels. Contact Peninsula TV at pentv.tv or call 650-637-1936. Welcome back to SMC TV. I'm Marshall Wilson, and today's topic is autism. We're now joined by Cheryl Young of Community Gate Path. We're also here with Dr. Heidi Feldman, of Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford, and Lisa Valerio, the parent of a child with autism. Let's start with you, Cheryl. Tell us about Community Gate Path. We heard about that in the opening segment, but tell us more about it. Well, Community Gate Path provides a wide range of services, and for children, we specialize for children who have autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, or other developmental delays. Uh, some of the services that we provide are the early intervention that Lisa and Dr. Feldman talked about earlier that are so important for children. We also have an inclusive preschool, and the inclusive preschool is where we have 80% of the kids are typically developing and 20% are the kids with special needs. So it's an environment where kids can really learn from each other and really thrive. And another project that we have up in South San Francisco, which is possible through funding through the First Five Commission, is called Watch Me Grow. And Watch Me Grow is a project where we're trying to identify kids that have developmental concerns and then get them into services. So in this last year, we've been able to screen over 350 children in that project and have found about 40% of those kids um, there are some developmental concerns. So initially you might go, oh my gosh, 40%, that's terrible. But actually it's a great thing because identifying those kids early, we can get them into services so that when they go to kindergarten, they're going to be ready for kindergarten and the chances for them to be successful are just greatly improved. One way I think we can think about the services for ch uh, children with developmental delays is almost like medicine. You know, if your child has an illness and you uh, recognize that illness, if there's a medicine, you give that medicine. You'd never think about not giving that medicine. And I conceptualize early intervention in the same way. It happens to be a behavioral medicine or a developmental medicine, but it has that importance in the life of a child with developmental delays or disabilities. It really does. <clears throat> you know, I think, Dr. Feldman, what you talked about earlier is that it, early intervention is a partnership, um, you know, among professionals and families because families know their kids best. And by really working together in this partnership, that's how we can really get a good idea of what the kids' needs are, um, how they learn, how they're motivated. And um, by working together, that's where we see the great success with our kids. Right. So sometimes children with autism in particular can create an environment around them where parents don't know how or when to interact with their child. The child doesn't give out the signals that other children give out. And the early interventionists work with the families as well as the child so that the families know how to come in and interact more meaningfully with their child and more regularly with their child in order to boost that child in the right direction. I wonder, Lisa, do you have some thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, we have used a very sort of eclectic approach, actually, with Nathan when it comes to therapies. And we really started with, at Community Gate Path when he was younger, we worked with a special educator who had a background in floor time and DIR. And then we realized as he was growing that we needed to uh, actually add a behavioral component to his therapies. And then we have his speech and occupational therapy. So I think that the combination of all of those things working together and a cohesive team really partnering with me and my husband has really made it so that Nathan really can make um, significant progress um, and be able to be a part of the community. Um, so I am a big proponent of sort of this eclectic approach and I think it's worked really well for us. Right, so um, just to give uh, the listeners and watchers a little background, um, one approach, the floor time or our DIR approach, emphasizes social interactions among adults and children sorry, with what autism. What does DIR stand for? 
So it's, I've forgotten. Oh. <laughs> but development. Oh, I'm now drawing. That, 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 that's okay. I, <laughs> development something response. All right. It's, yeah, it, it, it's a brand floor new. Floor time. It's called <laughs> floor time, and that's how people will um, ask for it. And um, so it emphasizes social interaction. The um, behavioral approach often gets called applied behavioral analysis, and it has a few different um, variations, verbal behavior analysis, pivotal response therapy, and that takes complex behaviors and breaks it down into simple steps and encourages and rewards children for progress toward the more complex behavior. And some children do better with that highly structured approach, and some children do better with uh, a more social approach, and some children need, as Nathan needed, a mixture of the two so that he can be making progress but still learning how to interact effectively with his family and with his world. And it sounds like all this work you've done with him has really paid off tremendously. You've gone on vacation with him recently. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we, I would say that you know I'm I'm very proud of Nathan. I mean he's still a child at the age of five and a half um, that is fairly nonverbal, but we have you know tools in place for him to be able to communicate with us. He has a Go Talk board, and he has a PEX uh, binder at home that gets him outside of the home where he when he's in home we use this PEX binder because it has everything in the house and it's easy for him to communicate and then when we go out he has a go talk board and I can take him anywhere I mean I can bring him out and um, we traveled all the way to the Philippines this year which was mm. a, a big 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 trip and he did great it was um, it was pretty rewarding it was fulfilling and I can bring him you know to the you know the local cafes and um, he, 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 he blends right in so in fact, it's interesting, Lisa and I ran into each other at a local cafe um, on Burlingame Avenue on Saturday, and Nathan looked like he was right at home, and you were telling me how you've introduced him to that environment, which is a very noisy, chaotic environment on a right. Saturday morning. Well, I brought up the ceiling fans. He would get really scared and sort of fat, you know, mesmerized by these ceiling fans, and there was about six of them that go in, in this uh, story, and he would, he would get so scared. And so talking about a behavioral approach, what we did is we would go, and we just would go to the door and make him, you know, look at him. And then, you know, the next week we just have him step in. And we did that for about just a week. All he had to do is step in. And then we got it to where he could sit at the counter. Um, and, you know, then we just kept making progress until we got all the way to back where we could sit as a family and eat. And he loves potatoes. So the reward was, as long as I walked away with the potatoes, <laughs> that, he, you know, he got, to, we got to go to Alana's. So... I want to bring up another first five um, uh, program that's available to families in San Mateo County and also to the professionals who care for them. Um, we have an interagency collaborative. And when there are children who have many different issues going on, let's say they have uh, serious health concerns as well as developmental concerns such as autism, we can discuss this child at the interagency collaborative and pool all of the resources of San Mateo County to putting together a comprehensive plan that will make more of a system of care out of our non-system of care than, we, than that family might have experienced otherwise. So we have public health nurses and mental health professionals and other and the Golden Gate Regional Center and school districts all represented at this interagency collaborative. So um, sometimes if it really is difficult for families, they might suggest to one of the professionals involved with their care to bring the case to the collaborative for this rich conversation and for a revisit of what the plan is and maybe a coordination of that plan. It's quite difficult for families to negotiate this diffuse uh, set of circumstances and first five is really trying to help us pull things together and get children what they need at a young age. That's really what we're seeing is um, our role increasing in helping parents navigate through the system. Uh, we've had a family resource center for the last 20 years that is staffed by parents who have children with special needs and now we're putting all that information online for the Ability Path um, dot org which is also funded by First Five. Um, when a family first hears the word autism, it creates this incredible feeling of terror. Um, and if you go to Google and you text in autism, um, you will get back 17 million hits. 
where does a family start? Right, it's overwhelming. Overwhelming, where do they start? So Ability Path is just a terrific uh, site that we've been able to develop with the help of um, professionals like Dr. Feldman that will have um, evidence-based vetted content um, and also a social networking piece to it so that families can find each other, can learn from each other and learn about resources. I want to talk, Marsha, a little bit about the prognosis for a child with autism. I think it springs off of some of the things that Cheryl just said. In the past, we offered families a dire prognosis when their child receives a diagnosis of autism. We told them things like, the abilities that you see in your child at age six will be the abilities that that child has lifelong. We were wrong. And I think one of the biggest changes in the care of children with autism is that they now stay in their families and go to schools in their community and continue to get this rich array of services as they progress all the way to adulthood. And not surprisingly, when you commit and invest in children, even children with autism, they make enormous progress over their lifetime. And so what we need to do is support families who are really pioneers. There aren't people from the generations before who are doing what Lisa is doing. And they need, they need public health help and they also need um, uh, interpersonal help and support. And whatever we can do in the helping professionals, we should be doing because it will make an enormous difference lifelong for those children. Well, we only have a little over a minute left, so tell me a little bit more about Ability Path and when it's going to go live and your blog. Well, <laughs> it's going to go live, Cheryl. Do you have the exact date? I don't have the exact date, but within a month. With, okay. Within a month. It's now so within a month. About May. Right. May. Okay. And um, I am writing a blog um, about my experiences with Nathan, all the way back from. My very first blog is called Reflection, so people can go back and look at that. But it really, it talks about Cheryl. It's, it's devastating when you first hear that your child has autism. But there's a lot of hope. And, um, you know, who would have thought that, you know, three years ago I'd be on a, on a plane to the Philippines with my son. So um, there's a lot of stories and um, things about um, things that give me hope about my son that's going to be in the blog and things that really frustrate me. So I'm hoping other parents will join me and we'll be able to blog back and forth and be able to vent and to be happy together on the on the blog. And I, I think that frustration is, uh, you know, any parent's frustration is that I have a 16th month old at home and um, she can be quite challenging herself at many times. And I want to thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. And thank you, Cheryl, for joining us on this episode of SMC TV. We have a lot more information on the web here, or excuse me, on your screen there showing the website addresses. And thank you for joining us. I'm Marshall Wilson.